I'll tell you a couple stories. In 1992, was any of you born in 1992? Yeah. The leaders were? Any of the youth? No? Any, any young adults kicking around in here? That actually... 1992, my youth group in Kingston went on this missions trip to England. And uh, while we were there, we did a bunch of things in schools, some really cool stuff. We did school assemblies, and, and, and we worked with the churches over there, and we did youth, youth rallies, much like this one, not staying up all night. I'm too old for that now. Uh, we did a lot of cool stuff, and uh, there's this one student uh, that we, uh, in one of our first school rallies that we were there, didn't come from a church, uh, had no church background whatsoever, and uh, we did this uh, world religions class in this school, and he had a lot of questions for us, and, and we talked with him, and uh, he showed up at one of our youth rallies that first week. And uh, from that point on, he just started sort of following, or following us around everywhere. And a week and a half later, or last night, we had this huge youth rally in the church. And uh, this student was still with us. And you know, you'll, part, you, you'll, you'll, you'll forgive me if, uh, if, if, I, if uh, my youth group back then was a little Pentecostal. Okay, we were a lot Pentecostal. And before the service, we got together in one of these huddles, and Pentecostals know how to pray. And often when we pray, we pray loudly. And we say things that just sound like gibberish to a lot of people that aren't part of the Pentecostal club. And uh, we're... We're in this group and we're huddling and we're, we're, we're praying and we're loud and, 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 and this unintelligible language is, 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 is pouring out and this student that's with us who has been following us around for a week, week and a half, has no idea what's going on. But there he is, praying with us, praying for us, hands on us as we are praying. The student got it. And as we were praying and as we were worshiping, this student connected with Jesus. There was another student that week, also in one of these world religions classes that we did. He had been in a church before, but it was a bad experience for him. And uh, he had stopped going. And there we were, 10 high school students and just graduated from high school students in their class, sharing things with him that he had heard before, but putting a different spin on it. He asked some questions, and that was it. We as a group started praying for this student. We, don't, we, we didn't know if we were ever going to see him again. And there on that last night, he showed up to the service. Now, I don't believe that we show up to services on a whim and that we're here all by chance. We're here with a purpose. And you might not be aware of that purpose, but God believe it or not, has brought you here. You sit there, well, no, wait a minute. Mike brought me here. <laughs> or my parents brought me here. It wasn't God driving that car. Well, you're right. But God knew you were going to be here. You're not here by chance. You're not here by accident. That student that was in that class that had had that horrible experience in church, the end of the night, we have this altar call. That's when we call people forward. We pray with students. He didn't respond. It's okay. Everybody was packing up and 
we were starting to say goodbye to some of the church leaders there. And the student had come back. He was still there. Sitting down near the front of the church. And so myself and another one of us students from KGT uh, sat down beside him and we started talking. And in the best English accent that I could possibly do, and I'm horrible at English accents, <laughs> Say, you know what? I'll give it a go. <laughs> I'll give it a go. I'll try this Jesus thing out. And so we knelt with him and we prayed. And he asked Jesus into his heart. This is 1992. I have no idea if he's still serving Jesus. But in that moment, with all the stuff that was going on that week, with the worship, <laughs> He connected with Jesus. He connected with Jesus. I'm going to tell you a little story found in the Bible. If you have a Bible, I might have to pick myself off the floor from fainting that a student actually brought a Bible to church. Gospel of John. Him and he wouldn't have given you 
living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, and, who, and, and, and did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus gives her a long answer that essentially says yes. <laughs> Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Are you better than our Are you better than our Father Jacob who gave us this water? Well, the water he gave you will make you thirsty again. Water I give you? Not so much. You'll never thirst again. So yes, I am better. The woman said to him again, Sir, give me this water so that I can so, so that I won't get thirsty. And I don't have to keep coming here to draw water. She's not quite getting it. Not, not at all. Oh, it's such a chore to come to this well all the time. If you'd only give me this water, then the things would be cool, and I would never have to do this again. Do you know how tough this is? He told her, Go call your husband and come back. Wait a minute. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus answered, Jesus said, work. You are right when you say you have no husband. In fact, the fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is true, quite true. Never met this woman before. Jesus just sort of gets her over the head with this one. Yeah, bring your husband. Wait. Wait, I'm a husband. You're right, you are. You've had five. And the sixth dude that you're living with ain't your husband. Huh. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. She's sort of cluing in at this point. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain over here, but you Jews claim that we must worship in Jerusalem over here. Woman Jesus, replied, woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. A time is coming and, now has, and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks God is spirit. His worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, God Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus drops another bomb on her. Then Jesus declared, I, the one who is speaking, the, the one who is speaking to you, and he. That Christ that you're expecting to come? Yeah, that's, that's me. Huh. Huh. Just then the disciples returned. Jesus, Mary, band of twelve. And they were surprised to find him talking to a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Why are you talking with her? Then leaving her, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to, to, to the town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his, disciple, then his disciples said to him, What did they say? Someone had brought him food? <laughs> Here we go. Then his disciples. 
disciples said to each other, but someone brought him food. My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still, it's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look. The fields, they are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life. So that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. That's the saying, one who sows, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days because of his words. Because of, and because of his words, many more became believers. There's a lot in this chapter, but I'm only going to really focus on a couple of verses. Jesus said, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or that mountain. So it doesn't matter if you're a Samaritan or a Jew. It's not about where you were born. The Father is seeking worshipers who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Worship is not about location. I got a text message from Mike a little while ago asking me to speak. And uh, said, our, our theme for the night is sort of this. And I went, okay. I can do something about that. And I kept coming back to this chapter. So much in it. But it, Jesus drops this gem about worship right in the middle of it, and he says, Worship's not about location. It's not about being in this room. It's not about being in your home church, wherever that might be Bethel, St. Andrews, yeah? Bethel? All, all, all of it's Bethel? Harvest Ministry. Harvest Ministry. Frankfurt. Wow. Okay. Sterling. It's not about being in the big room in your church. Worship happens there, and it's one of the reasons why we come there. But it's not about being there. It's more. Worship's not about where you were born. If you were born in a Pentecostal family, and you grew up in a Pentecostal pew, and you've heard all these songs a thousand times through, and you've got all the Hillsong CDs, and you've got all the Jesus Culture CDs, and you know what worship's all about? Great. But it's so much more than that. It's not about where you were born. We've got so much in Canada. We have so much freedom. We have so much opportunity to come to places and come to events like this so we can experience the presence of God. Where people in other countries don't quite share those freedoms. And yet, there are Christians in those countries who worship together. The gospel has gone out. It's not about where you were born. Worship is about who you are. Worship is about who you are. And to couple that, how you live. Worship is so much more than singing and good music. Although, I'm not going to lie, I prefer good music to not good music. <laughs> the first church I served in, bless them, they tried. <laughs> they had and over like that. And they had this organ that really sounded like a cow with a bad taste of, with a bad case of the flu. 
It was the worst sounding organ I have ever heard. But they tried. And man, it was hard to worship in that place. And it was hard to introduce new stuff in that place. But they tried. When I went off to Bible college years ago, when the Dead Sea was merely sick, <laughs> um, oh, yeah. read your Bibles. Figure it out. The music I was used to in my home church, like you, you would think the music in my home church from 1991 was lame. Okay. But it was, it was top of the line back then. It was awesome stuff. I got to the churches in Peterborough. And it was different than what I was used to. And it wasn't quite as good. And I found a real struggle to worship there. Uh, since then, I've gotten a little older, gotten a little more mature. I can handle that music a little easier now. Because it's not about the music. It's so much more than that. It's about me. And about how I connect with Jesus. Because worship is really that. Us seeking Him so that we can connect with Him. And it goes beyond singing, it goes beyond preaching, it goes beyond reading the Bible, it goes beyond pre uh, it, it goes, it goes beyond listening to a sermon. It goes it goes way past all that stuff. It goes to how we do stuff in school. It goes to how we play sports. Now, I don't look like an athlete anymore. Because I'm not. But, I, I used to have this affection with sports, and I still do. And I used to play them a lot when I was younger and in shape. Doing my best on the on, on the playing pitch for, for soccer. I almost called it football. Yeah. Move the ball with the foot. It makes sense. But yeah, I digress. Um, how I play tennis on a tennis court. If I'm not giving my best, huh? Then my worship is somewhat substandard. Because when I play sports, it's worship. When I go to school and I study and do my best on tests, whether that's an A or not quite so much an A, and I was usually in the not quite so much an A category, it's worship. How we react to our parents, how we deal with our parents, how we deal with our, our friends and, and people that we may not even like. It's worship. It's kind of scary. But worship is not about just this. This is good. So much more. It's about who we are and how we live. Worship must engage your spirit as we seek truth. Jesus says, Father seeking worshipers who will worship in the spirit and truth. So, if worship must engage your spirit as we are seeking truth, then there must be truth contained in the stuff that we are, that we are using to worship. Check my other notes before I say something. Must be truth from the stuff that we're using to worship. So, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the songs we sing is really Bible verses, repackaged and reworded a little bit. Most of the time, there's some lyrics that are somewhat questionable, but we'll get into that at some other point. Romans chapter twelve says this from the message. 
So here's what I want you to do. God helping you, take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you develops well-formed maturity in you. So, four things that I want you to take away from all of this. Number one, we worship God because God is alone worthy of worship. There is no other reason to worship Him. None. He is worthy. That's it. You need no other reason. You can read Psalms and you can read thousands of reasons to worship. But it all comes back down to this one. God alone is worthy. That is why we worship. That is why we do what we do. Number two. Worship is an act of surrender. Where I relinquish control and recognize God's rightful place in my life. Worship is an act of surrender. I, I love that Rob touched on this with that one song. You know, prior to last week, it had been a couple of years since I've heard this song. I forgot how good it was. And when I heard it, I'm going, yeah, I know it. It sounds like about six other Hillsong choruses, which is, about, which is true about every, about every song that they do. Um, I'm going, yeah, it's good. So I have to listen to the CD again. Oh yeah, this is, this is really good. Yeah, I like it. Okay. Maybe in my next church we'll do it. Um, the song's about surrender. And I, I, I have another favorite song that I used to do at Bethel all the time. Which is also a song about surrender. And I could think of probably 30 songs that I did at Bethel that were about surrender. And because it's, just, it's, it's, a, it's a topic that I keep coming back to. And when I think about Jesus, when he says, if you would come after me, you must take up your cross, deny yourself, and then follow me. Jesus calls us to that life of surrender. And worship is that it is one of the things that we can do as an act of surrender. Where, where we say, you know what? God, I relinquish control. I give everything to you. My life is yours. Have your way in me. Almost a quote from that song. Surrender. Worship is an act of surrender where I relinquish control and recognize God's rightful place in my life. Three. Worship connects the common with the holy. Worship connects the common with the holy. The title for this message is More Than a Concert. Karaoke. <laughs> I forgot my title. It's the last thing I do in a message. More than a concert, more than Christian karaoke. We're not just having a sing along. The band, as good as they are, aren't having a concert. We didn't pay for tickets to come here. We're not going to buy their CD at the end. They don't have a booth set up. You don't have a booth set up, right? No. Just oh. <laughs> Because they are that good. They, they could have a CD and tour and have all these lights. And... 
just kill it with the decibels. <laughs> they could do that. Might be far from perfect. <laughs> Three people in this room got that. <laughs> um, back down to my notes. Worship connects the common with the holy. The purpose of worship is to connect us with Jesus. The student I talked, the two students I talked about in England, they connected with Jesus. Not because the Canadian group was cool. We were. But that's not why he connected with Jesus. He didn't connect with Jesus because we talked like the TV. Second time I went to England in uh, 2001, one of the first words out of a student in that church. You talk just like the TV. <laughs> okay. Um, worship connects us with the holy. It connects us common folk, us common people, with an uncommon God, the creator of the universe. And lastly tonight, worship teaches us and others what we truly believe. Worship teaches us and others what we truly believe. What do I mean by that? Most people can tell what your church believes by the songs you sing. Why? Because we don't have a creed. At least in, in, in the Pentecostal churches that I go to. We don't have a creed. So, people will look at the words in your songs and figure out what it is that you believe. And for some of the songs that we sing, that's absolutely scary. But not only does it tell others what we believe, it reinforces in us what we believe. There is an old saying in the church, and it's in Latin, so I'm not going to even attempt to say it. But what it says in English is this, that which we sing, we believe. That which we sing, we believe. Yeah. So we, we believe what we sing, and we sing what we believe. So some of us probably need to start thinking about some of the things that we sing. Because we probably don't want to believe some of the things that we do sing. But worship teaches us and others. But we truly believe every eye closed, every head bowed.